two, three, one. Okay. We're just going to talk for a few minutes from Second Peter. Second Peter chapter two. And this is just an encouragement for us. Because though the scriptures are from old, they are as valid today as they have ever been. And in some ways, probably more valid today than they were in the past. So we're just going to read through Second Peter, and I'm just going to talk about it as we go. And I pray that it will be beneficial to all of us in our spiritual growth. So verse 1, Second Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring up on themselves swift destruction. I want to talk with us about being extra careful about false prophets and false teachers. Extra careful. Because, as we know, we live in a world of deception. And so I don't want us to be caught up in this world. And so the Apostle Peter is talking about in the past where there were false prophets. And I'm just going to back these up by just using the Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 13. So it's Deuteronomy, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 13 and verse 1. And so Moses is saying here, if there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve him. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet. So this is not new, what we're experiencing today, and what the church experienced in the past, and what ancient Israel experienced in the ancient days. There's nothing new going on here. It's been going on for a very long time. And did you notice in chapter 13, verse 1, Verse 2, it says, even if the sign and wonder come to pass, because it may come to pass, because Satan is able to transform himself into an angel of light, to make it appear like what his servants are saying is true. But the scripture says in verse 3 of Deuteronomy chapter 13, don't listen to them because they want you to serve other gods. In our case, it's a little bit less um, pronounced about serving other gods, but it's really moving our philosophy from the Bible to whatever is being taught. So that is the message today. That false prophet, back to 2 Peter chapter 1, there were false prophets in, amongst the people, so back in Deuteronomy, even as there are false prophets among you today, who privily bring damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. So we've established that false teachers and false prophets have been going on for a very long time. Let's turn our Bibles to Jude in verse 4. Let's start at verse 3. It says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend 
for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. In the time of Jude, which was the early church when the apostles were still alive, false teachers were already in play. And so the apostle Jude wanted to just write about Jesus came, he died for our sins. We need to repent and turn back to him and you will receive salvation. You will receive Christ into your heart through the Holy Spirit and you will be ready for the resurrection. But he couldn't. Instead he had to write about, oh, my brothers and sisters, there's a fight going on. We gotta contend. We gotta fight for the truth. Because the people out there who are trying to take out away the truth or to pollute the truth or to pervert the truth. And so he says in verse 4, for there are certain men who crept in unaware, as in people have come into the church, pretentious. We didn't spot them quickly. The leaders in the church missed something along the way, so now they're in positions of authority in the church. Who before of all time were ordained to this condemnation ungodly men, turning the grace of God into a lasciviousness, into license to sin. How many of these televangelists have you heard been caught up into lasciviousness? They've been caught up into doing things that we can't imagine. And typically, it's either about money or it's about sexual immorality. And some have even denied the only Lord God and our Lord, Lord Jesus Christ. They've left the faith. And they are communicating to people, oh, I don't believe in Jesus anymore. I don't believe in God anymore. And they preach another gospel that is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. They preach the gospel of health and wealth and how much money you can have and how you can live um, uh, healthy forever and rich forever as long as you sow a seed into their ministry. So back to Second Peter. The warning is that we need to be aware of false teachers because they will bring damnable heresies. Why is it damnable? It's damnable because if you believe it and start to live in that way, that you will not enter the kingdom of God. It's a very serious matter. Like, it's very serious. It's a life or death issue that is before us. We cannot afford to be deceived into believing any of these heresies that's going around. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Still on the same theme. The disciples asked, asked Jesus in verse 2. Sorry, in verse 3. And as Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Can you tell us what the signs of your coming will be? And what signs we will see before the end of the world? Okay, so Jesus gave them a few. But I want to focus on verse 11. And it says, And many... Not just a few, not one here and one there. There will be many voices, many voices around us. They will be on TV, they will be on the internet, YouTube, Facebook. They will be in the newspaper, magazines. They will be in newsletters, electronic newsletters and paper newsletters. 
that will be in your neighborhood? False prophets. Many. That means that they'll probably be even more than the truth tellers. Mm -hmm. will, they'll be able to overwhelm the message getting out. So we have to be on guard. We have to be diligent with the Word of God so that we cannot be deceived because many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And how you prevent yourself from being deceived is by knowing the Word of God. We've got to spend time in the Word. Not on top of the Word, but in the Word. We've got to get into the Word, not on the surface, because they will trick us. They will deceive us. And they will make mincemeat of us. And before you know it, we're at places that we never thought we would be in our belief and in our actions. So back to 2 Peter. They will bring damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and will bring upon themselves swift destruction. And this swift destruction, it's a relative term, because it doesn't mean that they're going to die right away. It doesn't mean that a, a lightning bolt will hit them. It just means that in the process of time and when you compare their time to eternity, it's a very short amount of time that they will live and do whatever they're doing. But the fact that God allows it, and He allowed it back in Deuteronomy 13, He allowed them to be able to prophesy lies, but then He, he places the accountability on me and you to say no because it's a test for me and you. Will we believe the truth of God or will we believe the lie that we hear? That sounds good. So in Deuteronomy chapter 13, the Israelites were being told by these false prophets and dreamers that, hey, look, it's okay to worship an idol, a Molech or whomever. Look, they give us the rain. They change the seasons. And what, is your, what has your God done for you lately? There's no water to drink. But look, there's water over there. And those gods are doing their thing. And so the people got deceived in ancient Israel time. For you and I today, the message is the same. They fine-tuned the message a little bit differently. And now they say to us, hey, what's wrong with love? I can love anybody I want. Or they may say, oh, what's wrong with having sexual relationships outside of marriage? That is so old-fashioned. What do you mean? We can do whatever we want. If it feels good, we should be able to do it. And we can't allow ourselves to get caught in that. What's wrong with a little bit of yoga and doing yoga and practicing a bit of yoga? We're still Christians. What's wrong with horoscope? So the philosophies of this world, these heresies, even being taught and practiced in some of the churches in our society, are false teachers amongst us. And verse 2 of 2 Peter says, And many shall follow their pernicious, sinful way, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. My brothers and my sisters, verse 1 says that many false teachers out there. Verse 2 says, Many shall follow their way. Jesus said, Many that the broad there are two ways to life or to, to live. 
One is the broad way, and many find that way. Then there's a narrow way, and few find that way. Deception is rampant in our world today. I am here to caution you that you take everything and you filter it through the Word of God. Filter it slowly so that you can get the end of it all. You know, the, the rain falls outside and the best water is the one that, um, that is underground because you have the surface level, then you have the gravel, then you have the sand, and by the time it gets out to be used, it's beautiful water. And that's how we need to think about it too. When we hear something, we need to take it, hear it, and then have it drip through the Word of God, and then it'll crystallize in our minds what it is that we've heard. Because the deception, and the thing is sometimes they sound pretty good, they're pretty close. So we need to really pay attention to this because this is a life and death situation. We do not follow the philosophers of this world. We do not believe everything that we hear from this world system. The Bible says that Satan is the god of this world. If you are the god over this world, then this world, you're going to run it the way that you want. You're going to run it in your image. And that's how the world is being run today, in the image of Satan. And so, everything that he promotes is evil. It might look good at the start, <clears throat> but the end of it will be bitter because it's going to be evil. Satan said to Eve, Hey, look at this fruit. Most people call it an apple, but this fruit, it looks beautiful, doesn't it? And what did God say that you won't die? Ah, don't believe that. That the fruit is beautiful. And then Eve got tempted. And she said, yeah, it looks pretty good for the eyes, doesn't it? Ah, let me just try it. And she gave in to that temptation. With us today, it's pretty easy as well for Satan to get us hooked on things that are ungodly because we've rationalized it. And we feel, yeah, you know, maybe it's okay. Even though we know what the Word of God says. And so we have to guard against because why it is the path that leads to destruction and many find it. We don't want to be a part of the many because they're just running and flowing and doing whatever they're doing. But the narrow way is what we're called to. And that requires thought and diligence so that we stay in the narrow way. Look at verse 3. And isn't this our world today? And through covetousness shall they feign words or pretend words or uh, deceptive words and they will make merchandise of you. It's all about the money. Look for the money. Look for who is making the money. Because that is Satan's system. Satan loves to have people go after money and power. So Satan took Jesus up on the pinnacle of the temple. And he was tempting him. And he said to Jesus, Look, I have this entire world. I have the glory of the world. I have all the wealth of the world. I have all the money of the world. If you bow down and worship me, I'm going to give it to you. Because it was given to me. So I can give it to you. He wanted to trap Jesus with all the glittering stuff that money can buy. So when you see and hear the push for money, you need to be cautious and search that out. Anybody who's going around begging you money and insisting that you give money and whatever it is about money, 
slow down your thinking and pay attention. If they're living in mansions and they have airplanes and limousine and the big massive Mercedes Benz and all those accoutrements of wealth and they're billionaires, you need to slow down and think because that's what verse 3 is talking about. Through covetousness shall they with fame would make merchandise of you whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. In time the Lord will um, bring vengeance against those people. And so we might look at it and say, well, nothing is happening to these people. You know, what, what, what is God saying? What is He doing? Look at verse 4, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. For if God spared not the angels, that sinned, and cast them down to hell, and delivered them into a chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, verse 5, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah and the, Noah the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, verse 6, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with that overthrow, making them an example unto those who should live and godly, and deliver just lot vexed with the filthy conversation. For that righteous man dwelleth among them, and seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Verse 9, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Brothers and sisters, there was an angelic rebellion against God. God dealt with it. There was a full-blown worldwide rebellion against God and God dealt with it with the flood. After the flood there was another rebellion in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and the towns around it and God dealt with it. Verse 9 says, last part, reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Nobody gets away. Nobody gets away with sin and rebellion against God. Nobody gets away. The only one that gets away, and that gets away, so to speak, are those who repent and put their trust in God. He's our only hope. Christ is our only hope to escape the judgment of God. But you know what? The Lord knows how to deliver the godly and the righteous out of temptations, out of our struggles, whatever they may be. The Lord knows how to deliver. He delivered Noah and his family. He delivered righteous Lot and his family. And whatever we're going through, he will deliver us too. Mm -hmm. That's the message. God will deliver us. We don't need to worry about what's going on around us. Our world seems to be going mad with everything that they're doing today. And we look around and we wonder, what is going on? Why all this chaos around the world, not just in our country or our community, but around the world? What is going on? All these things are being orchestrated by people behind the scenes. It's not chaos for them. It's going according to plan for them. But I want to remind us that God knows exactly what is going on in this world. We don't need to be afraid or fearful. The angels, the divine beings that rebelled against God, God knew exactly what was going on. And after they sinned against Him, He put them in chains of darkness. He executed judgment on them. And the old world, in verse 5 of Second Peter chapter 2, he destroyed them in the flood. God knows what's going on. 
And God is not mocked. There's a judgment day coming where he will mete out judgment to everybody that has ever lived. And so the Lord knows how to deliver us out of trials and temptation and how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And so I want to come back to the main point, which is to be aware of false prophets. In Matthew chapter 24 again, verse 11, I'm going to read a few more verses from verse 11. So, many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Verse 12, <coughs> and because of iniquity, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. When these false prophets arise and they start teaching all the stuff that they're teaching, many people will fall victim to it and their love for God will start to dissipate. We won't be on fire for him anymore. We will start to chase the Almighty Dollar. We'll start to chase convenience. When they come in and say, you need to do this, And we say, no, are we willing to put up with the inconvenience that it will bring to our life for the sake of Christ? So convenience is an easy trap to fall in, and we have a way of just explaining ourselves away and all those things. And as a result, iniquity, which is going to be abounding because of the false teaching, when you speak to somebody out there who doesn't know the gospel, they won't want to hear you because iniquity is going to be so massive. And for Christians, our love will wax cold. And when it says wax cold, it doesn't mean that it leaves from here and come all the way down here. It means that it just slowly, slowly come down, slowly come down. What do you mean I have to go to church? I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I don't have to associate with other Christians. I can still be a Christian. What do you mean I gotta spend time reading the Bible? I listen to videos, that's enough. And so you slowly, slowly come down until you have no love for God or for spiritual things to bring you into a deep relationship with God. And that's how it works. They say, our love will wax cold. And so Jesus said in Revelation, look, you're lukewarm. I wish you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. What does it mean to be a lukewarm Christian? It means, yeah, I believe in God. Oh, I know I was saved and sanctified. I was baptized. But there's no fruit. There's no evidence. Because you and I cannot have the Spirit of God and it's not pushing out evidence. It's impossible. It's impossible. It's like if you're alive, there has to be some movement. The heart has to be beating. Some evidence that you're alive. And so the Apostle James says, faith without works is dead. It's not that your works save you or get you into God's kingdom. It's just that you can't help it. It's like fire shut up in your bones and you've got to live a godly life. You can't be out there committing adultery and think that you're a Christian and it's your way of life. You can't be going home, kicking the dog, slamming the door and beating your husband and wife. But you can't do that. And you say, oh, I'm a Christian. No, that's you moving into lukewarmness and heading towards cold, and Christ will spit you out of his mouth. Spit me out of his mouth, spit us out of his mouth. Mm -hmm. But this, this system of this world is pushing us towards 
not taking anything seriously. Verse 13. My brothers and my sisters, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. False prophets are, are here. They're not coming. They're here, and more are on their way. But me and you, let us endure to the end. Let us endure to the end. Let us not stop halfway. Let us not go in the middle. Let us not start to wax and to wane away back to coldness from where we came from. Let us endure. Watch out for false prophets. Watch out for false teachers. Watch out for those who deny Christ. Watch out for those who say, oh, well, yeah, you know, yeah, I mean, that was the Apostle Paul's feelings. He's not really quite there. Uh, yeah, I know Jesus said that, but he didn't really mean that. Yeah, I know the Bible says that, you know, we, we shouldn't um, pray for the dead or pray to the dead or... We shouldn't call any man, any, man, any man on this earth father in a religious sense. But, you know, it's like, so what? Like, he didn't really mean it that way. Plus, you know, we've been doing it for a long time. And then we just turn down the volume of conviction, turn down the volume of the word, and we don't implement what the Spirit is prompting us to do. So watch out for the teachers and the prophets and the false prophets and above all make sure that we pay attention so that we can endure to the end brothers and sisters he didn't say it was a sprint <laughs> it's an endurance race <laughs> it's an endurance race and it's not easy while we're enduring we have to walk through that narrow gate. And that narrow path for us is a single file path. It says it's straight, it's narrow, one person at a time. So if your family or friend or whomever they are is getting in your way, from you staying on the narrow way, you need to release them. Nothing is more important than you and God. Me and God. Nothing. And that's why Jesus says, if you don't love me more than your mother and your father and your brothers and your sisters and your first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, your friends, you're not worthy of me. Oh, by the way, if you don't love me more than your life, you're not worthy of me. It's a serious matter. We cannot allow anything nor anyone to come into our way between us and our Savior, between us and God. And don't matter what you hear coming to your eardrums from this world system, grab your Bible. See how it computes. And if it doesn't compute, you let it go. If it doesn't match the Word of God, move on. And even if what they, they said to you was true, but in the end it leads you away from God, back up. Because it was just misleading us away from God. But it sounded good. And so Deuteronomy chapter 13 warns us about dreamers. You will hear people say, I had a dream. What? I had a revelation from God. And they had this dream and it came through. And it became true and it was, yeah, okay. All right, what else you got? Let me hear more. And you listen carefully to what they have to say. And again, you judge it from the scripture. If it doesn't match perfectly with the scripture, we abandon that. And that's how we can endure to the end. When you're running a long distance race, 
You want to have some places to get some water from where you run with some water. And our water is the Word of God. That's what we have to sustain us. The Word of God. And through the Word of God, we have the Holy Spirit also inside of us that prompts us because the Holy Spirit is living water and it revives us and it refreshes us and, it, and He reminds us about truth. Give us conviction about what we are seeing, what we are reading, what we are hearing. So in closing, my brothers and sisters, we live in a world that is full of deception. When the disciples in Matthew 24 asked him, what's going to happen that we will know that you're coming? The very first sign that he said is, Matthew 24, verse 1 is, 20, sorry, Matthew 24, verse 4 and 5. Pay attention. Take heed. Don't get sidetracked. Don't lose your way. Make sure that nobody can deceive you. Verse 5. For many, here we go with that many again, shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So it's two different ways, right? One is, they're going to say that they're Christ, which is that big antichrist that's coming in the end, and then they will preach another gospel saying that this is Christ, that new gospel. So you and I are called to Pay attention, to take heed, and to endure to the end. It's an endurance challenge before us, brothers and sisters. Let it always be for the glorification of God when we wake up in the morning. Let it always be that God will get the praises from our choices, from our decisions, from the way that we think, for the things that we plan for, for how we raise our children, for how we speak to others, for how we think about others, let it all be for the glory of God because that will last beyond our physical life. Our time here on this planet is short. It's, it's, I mean, it's like this, very short, in comparison to eternity. And so Jesus said to his disciples, Oh, the devils are subject to you? That's awesome. Oh, you can move a mountain? You have a lot of money? That's awesome. But is your name written in heaven? That's more important. Because you can lose all your money. You can lose your health, your wealth. You can lose everything. But if you are a child of God and your name is written in heaven, nobody can take that away from you. And that is God's desire for us. He wants our names to be written in heaven. His desire is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you and I, even though we are Christians and we've been called and we're dedicating our lives, we always need to be in a spirit of repentance when the Spirit prompts us and tells us that we missed the mark here and there, let's be quick to repent. And then tomorrow, we continue enduring. And the next day, we continue enduring. When we fall down, we get back up and we start the journey again. When I was a young fella growing up, um, I used to walk barefooted. And if you ever walk barefooted and there's rocks around and you bump your toe, it hurts. And you always have to stop and hang on to it and depending on how young you are, you cry. But you get up again and you continue on with your journey. And that is our calling. Pay attention. Pay attention. Listen, but pay attention. Because we cannot afford to get caught in the adversary's trap. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord give you peace, give you joy. May this coming week be wonderful, and may the Lord keep you and provide for all your needs.
Thank you for hearing me. God bless you.